thing your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry of my heart is to bring you Well, good morning, Highland. I'm so glad that you're here today. You are blessing people around you with your presence today. And we've been blessed by an awesome and beautiful day that God's presented to us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for gathering as God's people and worshiping God together today. That's vital to our life of faith. Uh, we, you may look around and see some pockets that are empty. That's primarily because we have a large group of our ladies who've been off on a ladies' retreat this weekend, and man, everything that I'm hearing back, just just texts here and there. They've just been having a great, great time. Around our house, the constant question is, when is mama getting home? I don't know if that's a job performance review on me, I don't know what that is, but we'll, we'll actually be very glad when Shelly gets back around noon today. I know many of you will be glad to see all of them come back as well. Hey, if you missed the memo, tonight we are honoring our graduates. And I want to say to you, for the last two or three Wednesday night uh, no, hang on, Wednesday nights, got to get my days right, we have had the privilege of being upstairs with our youth group. And man, we have a really special group of kids here at Highland uh, who are about to make a huge transition into another phase of life. So I want to invite all of you to come back tonight to be a part of that as we, after our service tonight, as we celebrate their accomplishment. We're going to eat together. Uh, come, up, come back and be part of that. We're really looking forward to it. If you have your Bible today or if you have a smartphone, let's look in Hebrews chapter 10 as we honor God by studying wor- the Word of God today. Hebrews chapter 10. As you're headed there, I'll tell you a, a few little stories. One is George Perdiccas. George is a guy that his entire life for many, many years swirled around the anchor of faith. And he believed wholeheartedly in Jesus. But the thing is, he found over the years what he called the strict requirements of religion began to wear on him. And he got tired of trying to hold off temptation day after day. And in fact, he said, I I got tired of trying to maintain the impossible standards of religion. I wanted my life to be measured by my music, not by my ability to resist temptation. And as a result of that, he's completely given up on practicing faith. Or how about Betty Carroll, somebody that I've known for many years, who each and every Sunday she decides to stay home instead of going with her husband to the worship assembly. Instead, she stays home, she watches Charles Stanley on television, She doesn't ever come to any Bible class. Instead, she does her own study off on the side instead of being with her husband. The reason she says is because she gets more out of it. The reality is, all the people that are there are missing out on her being there. Or what about Ed Phillips? Ed grew up in the church, but over the years he became very much opposed to the church because of his new stepfather. A man that in reality, uh, wasn't living according to the will of God and, and, and was professing something in church, but when he was at home, he was very violent with them. What about Robert? Robert was somebody that uh, was blessed with an amazing woman at home. A woman who grew up in the church, a woman whose faith was very vital. Uh, she was somebody who was a great influence on Robert. And in, in fact, because of her influence... Robert decided he was going to be baptized into union with Christ. But over the years, because of the constant pressure from his family, he turned away from the church and from his own family and left to go be with his family's heretical church. And here's what he said to me. He said, I know what they teach there is false. It's just too hard to manage their feelings and the pressure they put on me. Or what about Teresa McBain, Bible class teacher and professing atheist? She says, I I live a double life. And the reason that she says she's rejected faith is because she can't maintain faith in light of what she perceives to be an oppressive message about women in the Bible. And now, 
she finds that life is very much a struggle because she still has to manage the way that she looks at faith with her still believing husband who prays for her daily. Or what about Peg? Peg's somebody who hasn't been to church in years, even though, astonishingly, her husband was a preacher. But ever since he died, she's never stepped foot in a church building again. She really can't give a reason why. She doesn't really know whether or not it's just the fact that he died and she didn't expect it. But she says, just for some odd reason, I just don't want to go. Or how about Judas Syndrome Jim? Not an actual picture of him, by the way. But here's a guy who quit church because constantly he looked around him and felt like there were so many things in church that they could be doing better. I want to just say, well, duh. Everything in church could be done better. We're made up of imperfect people. But because of the standard that he brought to church, he became too frustrated and he quit. What about marathon runner Christine? Blamed God when her mother left her home and her family and left her. And she says, I have come back to God because I came to my senses and realized Christianity is a marathon, not a 100-yard dash. I want us to think about the question today, can I fall away from grace? And I want to use as an anchor text Hebrews chapter 10, but also I'm going to look at a cluster of verses all throughout the New Testament. We'll be moving quickly through a lot of those. And I want to ask you if you will, look on the inside of your bulletin and we can have some of that material, especially the three points that I want to really press home today. We'll have that before us to look at. But as you have your Bible open, look in Hebrews chapter 10. We'll begin in verse 22 where the Hebrew writer is talking about those who had been in Judaism and then they saw that really Christianity was the, the natural outflow of being faithful through Judaism. But now their Messiah has come and they're following Jesus. But now there's all this pressure to go back to that way. To reject Jesus as Christ. And he's constantly encouraging them, don't give up on faith. You can't give up on the the one thing that God has been leading us toward throughout all of history with the advent of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Don't give up on Him. So the Hebrew writer, he writes to encourage them and he says in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And in verse 23, let us hold fast in the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. Over the course of the last 40 years, there's been a lot of writing on something, a theological strain called covenantal nomism. It's just a big term that really tries to describe a biblical truth. And here's the biblical truth, that throughout the Bible, the picture is presented like this, that we're saved by grace, brought into the covenant in union with God by God's grace, but then God presents a system or a way for us to live our lives once we're in the covenant. So God goes out of His way through His mighty acts to bring us into union with Him. And once we're there, He gives us a set of laws or commands or ways to guide our lives so that we would know how to maintain that covenant relationship with Him. And this is something that we see reflected all throughout Scripture. Let's go back to one of the biggest scenes of your Hebrew Old Testament Bible where you see the Exodus take place. What took place? God, by His tremendous grace, brought this people through the waters of the Exodus, through the Red Sea. And when He did that, He created a new people unto Himself. So they came through that water by grace, brought into God's new purpose for their lives, And what happened on the other side of the Red Sea? On the other side of the Red Sea, Moses ascended Mount Sinai. And there he received laws that were guidelines for his new people on how to live in the covenants that he had graciously brought them into. So the idea is they were saved by grace, brought into this covenant, and now they're given 
commands by which they're to live. How is that really that much different from us? Because in baptism, we go through our own exodus from sin. And we're brought through the water And the way that Jesus presents it, not only are we brought through this water by grace, we're brought into a new people, given a new purpose for life. And Jesus, on the other side of that baptism, presents us with commands on how to live our lives through the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings that He gave forth to us. So we're saved by grace, brought into the covenant, now we're given commands by which we're supposed to live. So think about the order. Think about the teaching here that's reflected from Old to New Covenant. Rescued by the gracious deeds of God. But then, once we're in the people of God, we maintain our position in the covenant. We stay in the covenant by listening and following the commands that God gives to us. But that really begs a question. What if a person's brought into the covenant, but then there's no obedience on the other side of it? What if they don't live a life filled with following the commands that God issues forth? What do we say about those people? Well, I want to ask three questions in conjunction with our main overarching idea of can we fall from grace. I want to ask three questions that correspond to that. Here are the three. Can I fall? How do I fall? And what do we do about it? And each of the three items that you see on the inside of your bulletin will go along with those. Now, uh, in my household, we play this little game. So when the kids come, they say, Daddy, can I? Daddy, can I? Usually, what they mean is, do I have permission? And in my usual sarcastic, snarky way, I will say something like, I don't know. Can you? (laughs) And I'm trying to show them (laughs) that there's a difference between can you and may you. Can has the question surrounding it about ability. Do you have the ability to do something? May I reflects the idea of permission. So when we ask the question we're starting out with is, can I, can we fall from grace? Do we have the ability, by virtue of the way that we fail to follow the commands of Jesus, do we have the ability to fall? That's our question before us. And I'll invite you to write this as our first thought. The reality is is really this, number one. The reality is, yes, we can fall from grace. And I think you're going to see that reflected here in Hebrews 10. And then we're going to go through a cluster of verses found in the rest of the New Testament here in just a moment. You start out in Hebrews 10, verse 26 though. And here's what the Hebrew writer writes. He says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. You know, anyone who has set aside uh, the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Well, how much more punishment, worse punishment, do you think will be deserved by the one who's trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace. And then verse 30, For we know Him who said, Vengeance is Mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. Verse 31, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think about out of all the verses that you find in the Bible, I think that last one is one of the most terrifying. It gives me chills every time I sit and I think about that verse. The reality is, Scripture pretty much is very, very clear in nearly every page that there is a warning about falling away from grace. You know, anytime you're engaged in parenting, you always come to this crossroads where your child decides. They're not going to listen to you. <laughs> and they're not going to obey whatever it is you've, you've told them to do. The interesting thing about that, when they're little and they're disobedient, they still look cute. And it makes it a challenge, doesn't it, as a parent, to overlook and look past that cuteness and try to correct them. The thing about it, though, is that the older they get and the more rebellious they become, the more tragedy and heartache begins to enter into our own hearts. And that's why you read in a passage like Colossians 3, children, obey your parents and everything. Now watch this. 
for this pleases the Lord. The interesting thing is, I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, God Himself is the one parent who has had more children go astray than any parent in history. God Himself has experienced more heartache because of rebellious children than any parent could ever even think about experiencing. In the words of Isaiah, all day long I have spread forth my hands to a disobedient or rebellious people. That's the heartache of God. And then you look in verse 30, back in verse 30, he says, We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. So we're talking about God. We're talking about his own heartache, the possibility that his children will run away from him. Now, anytime you ask this question, can we fall from grace? Invariably, somebody you know is going to come to you and say, now hang on a minute. This passage here in Hebrews 10, it's about people in Judaism who've now come into Christianity, but now because of pressure, they're going back to Judaism. And this really isn't a good text to talk about falling from grace. David, you're taking this really out of context. And there are a lot of people that you'll encounter who believe in a a way of thinking called once saved, what? Always saved. That's a a very popular way of thinking today. It's a way of thinking that really originated in the writings of Valentinus, who was a Gnostic teacher in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. And then also it's just kind of flourished over the years through Calvinistic teaching. And really about half of churches today, the different types of churches, really kind of follow this particular strain of thought. But especially the more extreme way of thinking about it with once saved, always saved, that's That's one of those doctrines that we struggle with when we encounter people in our work, our family, our friends. Well, what does the Bible say about this particular way of thinking? Let's kind of trace through. I'm going to roughly go in chronological order in your Bible. I'm going to start with the writings of Jesus. And I want to just get a couple of texts that will tell us how Jesus thinks about this. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Luke is writing, recording Jesus talking about a story that he's relating about how people receive the Word of God. And Jesus says, some believers receive the Word with joy, and for a while they believe, but in time of temptation, they fall away. And then again in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, Jesus says, the Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom, that is, out of His own people, all causes of sin, and all lawbreakers. What about the Apostle Paul? What does Paul have to say about this particular question? Galatians 5, verse 4, Paul says Christians who go back, they're Christians now, and they go back and they're trying to be justified again by the law, have been, what? Severed from Christ. Meaning they're in union with Jesus, but they have to be severed from Him And then he says these words, you have fallen away from grace. I don't know how language could be any more plain. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says that there were some who were his own disciples who had made a shipwreck out of their faith. And then he mentions them and that they had been handed over because they began to blaspheme. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 9, about his own salvation, and he says, I beat my body, I make it my slave, I overcome my temptations, in other words, so that after I preach to others, watch this, that I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And we can play a lot of word games and try to kind of twist that to mean you know rewards or whatever people try to do with that, but the reality is Paul's talking about a particular kind of prize in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul makes a comparison between the deliverance of the Israelites and the deliverance of Christians. Where they left Egypt, we leave sin. They went through the Red Sea, we go through baptism. They drank of the water from a rock, we drink of the Spirit. They ate man in the wilderness, we eat of the Lord's Supper. They were guided by a pillar of fire, we are guided by the Word. They were going to the promised land, we're going unto eternal life. And once he's made that comparison, watch what he says. These things of old happened as examples and were written down as warnings for us 
So that if you think you're standing firm like they did, you be careful that you don't fall. And then in 2 Corinthians 13, Paul challenges his readers to examine themselves to see whether or not they actually are in the faith. Test yourselves, he says. And then the Hebrew writer, he writes in chapter 2 and verse 3, he says, how shall we, we Christians, escape if we neglect this great salvation that's before us? Or what about Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, where he says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And then James writes, he says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, you are saving a soul from death. Brethren, if any of you, he says. And then Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, writes this. He says, If after you've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you're again entangled in those things and overcome, the last state has become worse for you than the first. And then he goes on and he says, For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than knowing it, than to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. A dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Over and over again. And then the Apostle John in his little letter, 2 John, says, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. So I think the biblical evidence is very apparent. It is possible for you and I to fall away from grace, to, to kind of leave the covenant because we have failed to really take into account and, and keep as important the commands of God in following Jesus. But then I want to ask this second question. Can I fall? I think Scripture is pretty clear. How do we fall? Now, if you think in your own brain, how would I answer this question? How does somebody fall from grace? And I bet you could think of a lot of different ways to talk about that, a lot of different examples in which people can fall from grace, but let me just sort of summarize all of those maybe under one big umbrella heading and it's your number two idea this morning, and it's maybe this. We fall because we lose sight of Jesus. I think there's something very important in saying that we as disciples are Jesus' followers. And the closer that we follow Jesus, the more likely we are to maintain our relationship with Him and to keep growing in that faith. Hebrews chapter 12, though, if you still have your Bible open to Hebrews 10, if you flip over a couple of chapters to Hebrews chapter 12, Paul writes this very thing. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12 verse 2. So the idea he's telling these, these really Jewish converts into Christianity, people who now have come to see Jesus as Messiah, he's saying to them, you make sure while you're tempted to go back to the old way, you make sure that you keep your eyes focused on Jesus because that will keep you from falling. The reality is, though, a lot of us, we get distracted. Just like Peter did when he got out of the boat and took a couple of steps on the water. Once the waves around him started crashing around, he lost his sight of Jesus. And he began to sink. So look back in Hebrews 10, verses 23 and following. The writer says, let us hold fast the confession of our, our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful, and let us consider then how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now watch verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another daily and all the more as you see the day drawing near. One of the ways people can fall is through what we might call sudden death. That is, they, te they, they take the will of God so lightly and the teachings of Scripture so lightly that they commit a sin so egregious that it's a, a, a complete dismissal of the way of faith and suddenly they find themselves in a lost state. There are some people who lose their salvation due to slow starvation. 
And as you look in your verse 25, I think one of the major reasons why people slowly starve out their faith is because they come to be among the assembled peoples maybe twice a month. And then it becomes once a month. And then it becomes none a month. (laughs) And the reality is, their faith becomes weaker and weaker and weaker as a result of that. They slowly starve out the things of God from their lives. But some people fall because they strangle it out by sin. They so harbor some secret sin, or, or maybe an overt one, and they so cherish that thing as the most important thing of their life, the thing that gives them pleasure, the thing that gives them meaning in life, that they end up allowing that sin to choke out the seed of faith which hopefully took root some years ago. Peter writes about it in 2 Peter chapter 2 and he says, there are some who are again entangled in sin and overcome. And the word entangled he uses there is a word for a spider's web. You ever seen a fly get caught up in a spider's web? And the more the fly struggles, what happens? The more he gets caught up in that web and he just can't seemingly escape from it. And Peter says that's how we can kill out our faith sometimes. So can we fall? Yes. How do we fall? Well, generally speaking, it's by losing sight of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then there are various ways that that kind of manifests itself in our lives. Let's close out by asking the last question, which is, what do we do about it? And I want to suggest to you this one simple thing, this one simple strain. There's a a multitude of ways we could answer that question, but I just want you to think about this one at number three. We keep from falling, falling by continuing to grow. We keep from falling by continuing to grow. Watch, Watch the Hebrew writer in a couple of texts we've got open right here. Look in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us then draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. This constant drawing near, this constant confidence we draw from the blood of Jesus. And then drop down to verse 35. He says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. In verse 39, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. No, we, we are those who have faith and preserve their souls. Listen to those words. You have need of endurance. You have faith. You preserve your soul. The way the Apostle Peter will talk about it in 2 Peter 1, he says we should be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And as a result of that, what does he say? We will never fall. Now, growing in Christ can take a number of different avenues. And I'm going to try to engage your mind a little bit in that in our Bible class in just a minute. But Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. The Apostle will write, my sheep, recording the words of Jesus, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Listen to that. Listening. Following. What a disciple is supposed to be. And as a result of that, we have confidence when that relationship is strong. For Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of My hand. Let's pray about it. Father in Heaven, we're gathered as Your people today. We're very mindful of our own state of faith. Father, my prayer today is that all of us would follow the words of Your Apostle and we would examine ourselves. See whether or not we're actually following Your King, Your Messiah, Your Your Christ. And I pray today, if that's not the case, Father, would You just help us to remedy that, to make that, to make that right. To rededicate our own hearts in following Your Son. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to leave you with one simple challenge today. You see it on the screen. 
I want you to make up your mind starting today and every single day this week to feed your faith. To make up your mind that you will grow. Because that's the only bottom line of how you're going to make sure to never fall away from grace. You keep growing as the Apostle says and you'll never fall. So what do you do? Just stop what you're doing right now and think about this question. What do you do Monday through Saturday to feed your faith? What do you do come tomorrow to make sure your faith is fed and it's growing? And let me suggest to you that if you're doing nothing from Monday to Saturday to feed your faith, you may not realize it, but you may be slowly starving your faith and growing weaker as a result of it. We're going to sing a song of invitation right now. I want you to think about yourself. Examine your heart. Examine yourselves, as Peter, Paul wrote, and see whether or not you're in the faith. Let's stand and sing. Thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine.